And uh, what, what Marvin used to tell people is it proved the lesson that there's nothing one man will not do to another. So anyway, Lee Marvin is Shaq. At, at a certain point, you see him decide. Um, it, it moves across his face. The camera lingers on him for a little bit. It's like a, the shadow of a cloud moving across his face. He's looking at Shaq, who's just killed another hobo standing on top of his train. And you can read his mind. I'm going to kill that motherfucker. And eventually he does. And uh, it's, it's kind of a, one of those little victories that give you hope in American movies. Um, I wish that this way went American culture. We still have the equivalent of hobos. Now we call them homeless people. Uh, in New Orleans, over the last uh, four years since Katrina, there have been 8,000 people, uh, men, women, children, living under the Claiborne Bridge, which is, uh, they have a tent city that's a mile and a half long. Whenever, um, whenever they have dignitaries or, any, or anybody coming to town, uh, Mayor Nagin uh, clears all these people out, puts them in temporary shelters, and uh, that's that. Um, but uh, it, it is still with us. And I thought in my last few conversations with studs that this was an important thing to, uh, to remember. If you notice, every single thing that these are made of are stuff that you and I throw away. It's matchbooks, it's wrappers, it's junk. Um, you know, in the early 50s, the Italians walked around picking up stuff off the street. And, you know, three years later, you had Art Povera. Um, <laughs> kind of like that. Uh, I, I like the idea of making things out of uh, uh, other things people throw out. Um, in the first body of drawing collages I made, which were about the history of Chicago, uh, I collected like things kind of specific to Chicago. And what I felt like is that all of these objects were charged with a history. And they all went a long way to telling a story. Um, the only thing I'm any good at as an artist is telling a story. Um, I'm you know, greatly inspired by great storytellers. <coughs> One of the marvelous novels I've been reading lately is uh, William Kennedy's Iron Weed, which is the story of Francis Fallon, who all but becomes a hobo, has to leave home um, because of the entombing uh, ennui of, of his failures as a father and, and a husband. And so he takes to the road. And like a lot of people did during the Depression, uh, and look for some place to fit in. Um, it wasn't merely uh, economic need. It wasn't merely uh, just finding a job. It was also maybe finding ourselves in, in the wide field of America. You know, who are we uh, in this place? Who, what do we mean in this place? Um, I, I think, truth be told, maybe that was uh, who I was before I, I found this. Before, as a young man, I figured out I could do this. Um, so what, what resonates with me uh, for, for the hobo culture is that we always think that the dispossessed and the underclass have gone away, and it's all been solved, and it has not. Um, uh, one of the reasons I do these, these talks is I've become quite a cheerleader for New Orleans um, and uh, Prospect One, which is one of uh, the projects where artists and the people of New Orleans got together and helped revitalize their culture. Uh, Dan Cameron curated it. He included 81 artists this year. And we all became uh, kind of Iranian soldiers for New Orleans. Um, when you go to that place, it gets in your heart uh, very quick. And they still need a great deal of help. Um, we always ask ourselves, well, what can we do as artists? We can do a lot. We can participate in uh, their economy of ideas as artists. We can show our work down there. We can help bolster that economy. And you know what? My friend Studs used to just sit down once in a while and just listen to people. He was an exquisite listener. Um, one, of, one, of, one of the greatest uh, uh, interviews I ever heard him do was with Bob Dylan. And it was the young Bob Dylan who was reticent and a little bit shy and a little bit unwilling to reveal himself. 
and stood, stayed with him and listened and listened and would ask him about this or that. Until finally, by the end of the interview, Dylan was interviewing studs. <laughs> and the same thing happened with Marlon Brando nine years later. Um, with what I have learned from making this body of work, and it's, it's real blessing, has been to sit down and just listen to people tell their story. Because uh, as that goes, so goes the story of Americans. Um, you know, uh, when I first started making art, I, I had two or three big influences. Um, Bob Dylan, uh, Lou Reed, uh, Studs Terkel, Nelson Aldrin, Mike Royko, and then as I kind of got my head out of my ass, nobody more than my friend Steve Earle, who's here. So, um, so uh, this has become a topic of conversation between him and me lately. Um, this body of work will be a book. It's called The Ticket to Canaan. And uh, I figure uh, every time you do an artist conversation, um, I always try to figure out just how interesting I am. And I always figure I'm about 30 minutes interesting. <laughs> and uh, we're there, so that's my story. And I'm sticking to it. Thanks for coming. questions or if you want to talk, hang around and take a look. Um, and uh, the, uh, the beer was uh, brewed especially for this event. It's called the Devil's Handshake. And it was made by three hobo lovers in Muncie, Indiana named Three Floyds. So, um, you know, if you have any questions, just, just haul on. Yeah, could you talk a little about the symbolism? Yeah, sure. What's the one, what's the one on your wrist? Well, this one means get out fast. And this one means don't give up. And depending on how my day is going, I look at one of those wrists. Um, you know, they're, they're basically very idiomatic. The, the two diamonds means be quiet. Um, and that, that one's been around since the Civil War. And that, uh, a lot of people think, comes out of the Confederate um, a, a Confederate patch. Um, a great many of the people who furthered and used the Hobo alphabet in the very beginning were Confederate soldiers. Um, they heard the trains and they went, you know, they went west and they went north, and, you know, to find work. A lot of these guys became cavalrymen, which is why a lot of people think that the Hobo alphabet evolved out of cattle brands. And it makes a little bit of sense because it's very simple. It's very easy to make it for, for a great bunch of the country which was not literate yet. Um, this, this was a, a, a very quick shorthand. This means safe camp. Um, and, and the symbol, uh, the hobo is the way they made it was like this, and then there'd be two kind of crudely drawn eyes. Um, just as a, like, to put myself in them, I, I put a blue eye in each in some of them. Um, and I stole that idea from Philip Gustin, he used to play his, his drunken head on tables and smoking cigarettes and, you know. Yeah, he was a million laughs. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, this one means get off, the, uh, get off the rails and go to the roads. And that usually means that there's Pinkertons or uh, an obsessively cruel conductor. And there were many conductors that people knew by name. Um, uh, Amarillo Slim, who was now a famous poker player, was originally a train conductor. And then there was Denver John, and these guys who prided themselves in murdering hobos. In fact, they used to notch their, their hammers or their uh, fire axes. I mean, uh, very often, you know, hobos were murdered with absolute impunity. Um, and the truth of it was is they were saying, well, they're, they're thieving scum, and some of them were, you know, I mean, hobos were, were very careful to distinguish themselves from tramps. Tramps were kind of the criminal class. 